Okay, so recording is on. Welcome. This is the this is actually the first event that we have in 2021 for both Lineage London, Lineage London, Lineage Global Meta Group and the Procamba Meta Group. So and I don't know whether this is you know what's the omen for the year, but we, we have both James and Andy. You know what I what, what a pairing we have. So it's it's gonna be a great hour. Um, lots of experience in the room as well with James, James, Andy. I can see names around here. Lots of experience in Kanban, in Agile for many, many years. So as usual with this Ask, um, ask Me Anything, Ask the Kanban Trainer sessions, um, feel free to contribute, contribute as well. Any sort of questions that you have for these two, um, I'll try to keep them in, you know, in check. Um, but see where it goes, okay? So typically, in terms of if you want to ask questions, could you please Put them in chat. We will be looking for them, trying to select a few as we're going along, you know, hopefully do as many as we can um, and talk about them for a while. Yeah. Um, while you may be thinking about what kind of questions that um, you have, you wanted to share with, with these two. Yeah. Um, shall we talk about a little bit like um, James and Andy? Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about your, your story, your, your story with Kanban. How did flow happen in your life? How did flow happen? Do you want to go first, James? I was going to say that to you, but um, okay. Um, potted history. Uh, 1989, joined the armed forces, uh, traveled the world, met interesting people, and then shot them, left that, taught myself to program and was a developer for a number of years, and then did some sort of weird guerrilla scrum thing for a bit from about 2005-ish. And then along the way, I bumped into the cuddly teddy bear, Mr. Jose Casal, yeah. <laughs> um, and became more. In fact, he came to Wales, I think was the, my first introduction to Kanban. He came to Wales and he did um, a session um, for a client I was working at the time on a, for a meetup group um, using the Get Kanban board game. And then that was it. That was that was me hooked. Uh, and then um, as I've gone further and further along that journey and got in more and more into the kind of the metrics and the, and the flow metrics side of things, I've become more and more hooked to the point where I realize I only ever talk about one thing anymore. <laughs> you know what? I had forgotten about that, but yeah, good. Blame me now. Okay. Andy, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, um, I was thinking mine's mine's kind of the opposite, the kind of the start of James where mine ends at the moment, actually. Um, well, uh, flow, let's go back to flow. Um, uh, I, I was I was on a chat with Dan um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I kind of described my, my little bit of history, and I, I realized that where where Dan was kind of working with Kanban and the kind of like the origins I was working at, I think it was at Nokia at the time. And there was, um, we were, we were, we were trying to do scrum. Um, and you know, the, the trying to is, is the kind of the, the word there. Um, and I guess where I was describing it the other day was throughout every time I've kind of approached teams and work, I've always started with that, uh, trying to, visualize how the work moves you know and it sounds really it sounds really naughty you kind of like it sounds like i'm trying to kind of go oh you know it's it's kanban by the book but you know or by the guide as it is now uh, but but it just became a logical place to start for me which is you know how how come uh yeah my brain is very very logical in flow and so it's kind of like how can i how can i understand how to help these people without if i can't really understand how they work or work transforms I was a, a developer uh, before then. Um, uh, my, see, this is where. Sorry, I'm going to ramble on until you stop me, Jose. But it's quite interesting. My wife, my wife did um, business decision analysis at, at, at university, and I remember back in you know the early uh, late 1990s and the, the early 2000s, playing with. She had a load of these kind of McDonald's simulators. It was brilliant because you could just like stack customers up and they'd get really annoyed. You know, it was just and it was all queuing. And it was kind of, you know, my wife should be doing what I'm doing. <laughs> it's kind of like, Everything you know, comes she, back to queuing, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And it was just, it was, it was fascinating. I mean, you know, we can go into James and James and I say, sitting at airports trying to discuss how to optimize, you know, boarding people without queues, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so, so now, now my journey is pro Kanban trainer, but, but it's, um, yeah, I like James. I I just I I just see cues and I just I just see flow and it's yeah it really is all I you know all all I look at you know regardless of where I am. 
think, uh, and we bumped into each other along the way, didn't we, Andy, at one point, we did. I think, as yes. well. And then there's a couple of other faces on here that I've worked with as well in the past, or um, briefly. Um, okay. but, I, but I think that kind of that introduction to flow thing, it's a bit, for me, it was a bit like the Matrix, waking up from the Matrix. So I'm like, <laughs> ah, shit, this is how it all works, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Could, yeah, very, could, very, put very that back in Pandora's box after that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think, you know, on that, I don't think it got really serious. You know, it sounds really silly, right? It didn't, I don't think it got really serious for me, but, until, you know, until the point somebody showed me the simplicity of the metrics around it. And then it was like, and then it was like, you know, it was like the Matrix. I don't know. The, the Matrix 2 was terrible. I don't know if there's like, you know, a better version of the Matrix 3. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> but it was like, it was maybe it was like doing the Matrix all over again, just better again but yeah and and i think you know that was the, the awakening for me it was like oh we can we can see we can really seriously figure this stuff out you know we can actually optimize our conversations better once we you know start to measure in a different way and it's like oh okay this is yeah this is where it works for me that's, that's a really interesting point because when, when i started to do kanban well, when, when i first started to use the word kanban back in 2008 or whatever it was it was yeah i didn't understand what i was talking about yeah and and even in the early years of kanban and kanban training a lot of it was um visualization like thinking about like kanban means a post-it on a wall and things like that um in your own opinion uh, and we started to get some questions here so we'll go into the questions next mm -hmm. but in your opinion um how has kanban evolved in your own you know your own journey to become you're talking about like the metrics that mm. that, that element how, how has how has kanban become that you know matrix tool that, that sort of like um, awakening do you, want, do you want me to say this one i don't know, like, I, don't know. Do you want, I tell you what what's going to work easier if you just fire it at one of us and then we'll, we'll... fire it. We'll go for it andy okay um how how is it i think um uh for me for me the real the real power came about uh where we three years later um uh, sorry, three years ago when uh, the Scrum, uh, the, the Kanban guy for Scrum teams came along, right? So uh, it's no secret I'm a Scrum.org, you know, trainer, um, you know, highly passionate about Scrum. Um, and the, yeah, the, the Kanban guy for Scrum teams came along and I, I kind of just jumped at it because it, it was all the things I'd been doing just wrapped up in a nice little document, right? And it was kind of, uh, obviously the training and the workshops came afterwards. And then it was being able to put something, this is why I really like the, the, the Kanban guide, because it is it, it was really nice just being able to put something around what I was doing mm -hmm. and formalizing it. And it's the only way I can express it. And actually being able to then point teams of people and say, look, I'm not just kind of, yeah, I'm not just kind of you know spouting a load of you know random stuff or just techniques or learnings I've had, but it was all it was all about you know I can actually point you at something that's been created and it it, it forms this part of a framework guide that we can actually all go back to and hold each other accountable on. And I think you know so so you know in answer to your question that was probably you know about three years ago when it when you kind of talk about the transformation actually now Kanban has become. Uh, is starting to become this kind of larger community of people who are really just passionate about flow and, you, you know, in whatever context and however you're using it, that for me is just brilliant. Okay. James. So I've, I've kind of already credited you uh, with um, being the kind of my muse for Kanban, uh, okay. Papa Bear, right? So uh, I think that if I was looking at the kind of the, 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 the journey of the epiphanies of Kanban as I went along that, that learning path, I suppose, where the first things would have obviously been the, just the visualization of work and being able to see where it all is, right? And it was a kind of, there was a step up from a traditional kind of boring scrum board in that space and the, and the limit in work in progress. Those were the two big kind of big light bulb moments for me, like actually this is the stuff that rocks. And what I realized when um, Jose came and did the session was that I had been doing this with a team probably like three years, two, three years before, and had had not really repeated the success I'd had with that team before, because I think they were implicitly limiting their work in progress, right? They, we didn't have explicit limits and we didn't, but we just decided as a group, we're not gonna work on more than n things at a time. And um, there was, you know, some people are happy to do that and some people 
were less easy to convince that that was a good thing to do, right? It was, it was productive. And so that kind of brought all that together. And then it went down the, um, the, the kind of the rabbit hole from there of doing a lot of reading and attending workshops and attending some of the training that Jose was providing and um, then stumbling across, as, as Andy says, stumbling across Dan's metrics. And then starting to use that to kind of inform my thinking on some of this stuff was a real, real game changer. And um, again, Echo and Andy, latterly, seeing the Kanban guide and seeing this succinct and simple, I'm going to say codification of what Kanban is, for me, uh, was just, uh, it re-engaged me with the whole, with the community side of it, because I, I know, I've gone down the route of being a trainer for um, other organizations and sort of stepped away from it all because it just it wasn't really, I wasn't in love with it, let's say at that point. And then coming back to a simpler codified Kanban guide that kind of reignited the passion for me a bit. Excellent. Yeah. And um, one thing that I will add, and we go to the first question then is as well, like um, many times we talk about, we talk about metrics and flow metrics and process and stuff like that. The thing for me about what makes Kanban super powerful as well, and is that it's actually very much a humanistic process, a humanistic way of working. Yeah, it's about making making better work environments for people to be yeah. to thrive, to be at our best. Yeah, we we use metrics, we use things like that, but it's not about the metrics and the process about mm -hmm. creating and enabling hum, human environments for people. Right. So, so the schools of thought, right? There's different schools mm -hmm. of thought in this, and you'll get you'll get some practitioners mm -hmm. will turn around and say it's all about the people. And that's true, right? But if you come at from my from my my own belief system, if you like, if I come at it from just the people perspective, then I'm not thinking about the process. I'm not thinking about the improvement. I'm not thinking about that continuous improvement. How we can pull the metrics in to do that? I believe that if you can change the system of work, people yes. will be happier. Mm. Yes. I don't believe that by telling people to have an agile mindset, magically all <laughs> of a sudden your organization is amazing, right? I don't. I think that's completely top. Put that Absolutely. right, um, yeah. and uh, and I'll make no excuses for me being probably the um, more opinionated and blunter of the coaches <laughs> in this session. Yeah, good stuff. All right, let's take a question. Uh, uh, Robert, you had a uh, Robert uh, Palkowitz, you have a great question there. Would you like to ask the question yourself, or you you want me to, to ask it on your behalf? Where is Robert? <clears throat> Robert is here. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, who your customers are? Who, who do you train? What are the profiles of the people within an organization that are being trained? Excellent question. Um, so anyone and everyone, as many people as I can get, as many as the people I can get in an organization to think about flow, that's if I'm doing internal training, particularly and coaching engagements to, to think about flow as possible, the better. Um, and I might tailor that training for different areas of, of an organization so typically if it's that sort of senior leadership or you know portfolio management side I, i've got um when we were doing this in meat space from in the real world before we all became part of the matrix uh i would i had some sort of uh, adjustments to the get kanban game that will allow us to do that and make make that portfolio side of this come a bit more um clear but uh and then obviously external training is public anyone that's interested in Kanban, anyone who's interested in self-improvement that kind of thing so you don't insist okay. on like everybody in a team or something like that oh um i i kind of like doing teams as teams i like to do them i like well, i like them from a training perspective to go through the training and have the same experience so yeah. that when they're talking about it post training in the future they've all they're all relating to the same moment in time um, but you know, you, you know, it, it, it's, you don't get that if you kind of split the team and do, well, do you have the team this week and have the team in a, in, a, in a month's time. And then the, the, the things that happen during the process of that training and the conversations that happen in the process of that training then become less relatable for that team. So I prefer to do it as a team, but you know, needs must. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And what are your oh, no, I was, I was going to go, uh, the great successes I've seen are, are kind of similar to James but it's that the the train train the team that is going to go and execute this and then coach them so be yeah. there afterwards not not yeah. just drop in as a as a trainer you know it, it, anybody anybody could do that right but it's it's the as James said it's that learning moment and being able to remind them of that learning moment 
you know, and that's that's the power. That's a, that's a beautiful bit. That is, then you turn around later on and go, "Do you remember when you did this in the game?" And then they go, "Yeah." I said, "Do you know why that was bad?" And they go, "Oh yeah." Right. And you can you can have those conversations. Right? And yeah. you're dead on with that, Andy, in terms of the the follow on, because yeah. you don't want to be Simon the seasonal seagull just flying over, dropping in a big yeah. Kanban egg and flying off again, right? Yep. Yeah. That's an that's an interesting thing when we're doing training because many times it's it's kind of like the, the, the beginning of the of the beginning of the course is right at the end of the course. As mm -hmm. in, you know, to spend, you know, um, when we're in person one or two days, right? When um, on when it's virtual, maybe a number of smaller sessions. The real that's, learning that's, starts that's, after that's, the course. That's just yeah. exactly that's just the beginning. Yeah. yeah. The, the the real learning comes up, starts afterwards, and and usually, you know, whether it's how we support it, how they're going to support that. Yeah. Um. It, it, it over the years it has changed as well. I mean, I think because um, I think Kanban used to attract a lot of the coaches. Um. It has changed now. Um. As in, like, there is more people doing, you know, working with Kanban. Yeah. So teams. Yeah. You may have senior, senior, senior managers. You have people in product. People, you know, um, people working in RTE in the start in in safe coming to say, please, 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 we need to learn how to do flow. Um. Stuff like that. Interesting. It has actually. changed. It has a much wider range of people as well. That that product space for me is a really interesting one at the moment because that's the one that I'm really encouraging the organization that I'm working with at the moment. That's mm. one that I'm really encouraging the product managers to get a handle on this stuff because yeah. of some of the pitfalls involved around having lots of large items in progress at the same time and how that can hide whip and all the all mm -hmm. the consequences that has against trying to prioritize in that space is meaningless at that point. And um you know, come on, of course, we'll tell you all about that. But um, it, it, so for me, that you know, if you want, if you if you're looking, you know, well, it's a thought I'm having at the moment in, in the organisation I'm working with is around if I can harness the power of the product owners, product managers, to be super conscious of that flow and that whip, then uh, that's a, that's a potentially a really really good driver for change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so, some of the some of the weakest weakest problems that we have in, in organizations are beyond the team as well. Is yeah. what happens between teams? What happens at organizational right right right, right. organizational uh, well, orchestration dependencies? All those things which which really get on the way. Yeah, kind of thing. But it, you know, and it comes down to that um, uh, decomposition problem mm -hmm. and funding problem. So so certainly in the product space is is you might have. Uh, uh, a product which is a product of products right um yeah. uh and so so it's often you know not even just you know you, you can overcomplicate it and talk about value streams but but it's really once you start to fund work you then have a decomposition problem because you mm -hmm. if if that piece of work is too large to be delivered by a single team and you've now scaled the problem is how do you realize the value return on that this kind of leads into James's world. So something James and I talk a lot about this kind of portfolio decomposition is, um, you know, how, how, how can organizations start to take this idea of large bits of work and, you know, through to many, many teams delivering them and still realize the benefit and the value that they originally funded. Yeah. You know, and I think like, like James said, my, my opinion on this is basically to left shift as hard as you can any decision. Because the the more you right shift and analyze, you're basically just creating more right. health for yourself, and you're delaying it, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, that's a like James said, it's like a this is a whole to a talk and blog and probably book in its own right. Yeah. And, well, if big if big batches are, are bad at the at the team level, what do you think big batches of portfolio <laughs> are going to be, right? Yeah. Good stuff. Well, right. I mean, talking about talking about this and and uh, question by by James is a very short question. James, uh, add to it if you if you if you need more. Uh, but he was asking like, what are the challenging parts or moments in implementing Kanban? Um, I can tell you about a current challenge I'm having uh, in in, uh, in an organisation I'm working with, which I've got um, a number of coaches who've come from within the organisation who don't have a massive amount of agile experience as, as a background. So for them. This all feels, particularly around the flow metrics, feels very esoteric. It's a really kind of like, whoa, you know. And you show, show somebody something like Actionable Agile, which is a wonderful, brilliant, powerful tool. Yeah. But because it's graphs and charts and it's a bit math, right? 
there's a there's an immediate kind of like oh crap I, I don't I don't I don't remember how to do you know the the the, the area of a circle so I'm never going to get this <laughs> right and so people go into a bit of a kind of they freeze it's a bit rabbit in the headlights kind of uh, moment so that's um, it's how so I've I've sort of switched to talking about some of the flow metrics particularly like cycle time as in really simple terms of how long does something take. Because mm -hmm. everybody can grasp that concept, you know, if you're, if, do you go to park run? Yes, right. What's your 5k park run time? Well, on average, it's this. And well, your average is bad for a start, but never mind. Um, you know, the time it takes you to run park run is a cycle time in itself, right? The time it makes you cook breakfast, the time it takes you to go through the queue at Starbucks and try and bring it into, into simpler terms. And you kind of get that penny drop moment. So, um, certainly, um, some of the, 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 the glossary, the terminology, right, in 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 terms of Kanban can be a little bit, um, a bit of a barrier to entry for some people. That's definitely one challenge that and what I'm having right now. See, I was going to, I was thinking about this. I was going to say whip patience. <laughs> so, you know, that, that moment where you start to say, you, well, you can, you can mathematically prove, you know, reducing whip will help them, right? Or you can, you can, you can show them that you know reduction in whip can help focus, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you, you start to work with people, uh, you know, maybe maybe a, a team of teams, and you start saying, you know, limit your whip, limit your whip, limit your whip. Yeah, you know, however you want to do that, but that's what you need to focus on. And um, but the impatience, you know, kicks in because it does take a little while for, especially if you you know highly complex, lots of work going on for that backlog of of in progress to clear. You know, especially if your cycle time is long. So, you know, I don't know whether you call it whip patience or whip in patience, but but that's I think the hardest thing to overcome is it's that human uh, side of it again, isn't it, Andy? Yeah. It's that it's that humanistic part of Kanban that's that's um, how do you how do you make that um, less, as you say, you know, less of a you know, it's like I never talk about Little's Law, right? Ever, if mm. I can avoid it. A, because I'm not an expert in Little's Law and there could be a mathematician in the room who's going <laughs> to kick my ass. So that's one reason. The second reason is it's just, it's just again, it's inaccessible. Some of this stuff is a bit inaccessible, a bit esoteric. Yeah. So it's, it's how do you, um, you can prove that in general, lowering your whip leads to shorter cycle times and more throughput, hurrah. But when, not, when you express it in those terms, there's a kind of a, I, I don't, I don't get it or I don't want to get it or that sounds complicated or more complicated than it needs to be. And it's a really counterintuitive thing to get over that, you know, by doing less, you're going to get more and you're going to get it yeah. faster. And they kind of go like, no, but I think, I think it's the, <laughs> but, but when you're playing into real life, right. So, so you've got to, uh, I mean, think even if you think, look at it in a, in a team context, you know, maybe, maybe you've got a suboptimal, you know, team flow, right. And the, the team has a large, queue within a portion of its flow it's still going to take time to clear that and yeah. and there is always that impatience there is always that um it's not working we did the change it's not working yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that daily that reminder yesterday. stop creating <laughs> stop creating problems for people further up you know and that well again they're, they're in leads one of the problems but but you know it's so so common to have the handle for the team but um so yeah whether you call it Whip, whip patience, whip impatience, but I think um, the practical side of that, you know, is yeah much much harder. Um, uh, you know, I used to I used to think it was actually you know convincing people to limit whip was really hard, but I think it's actually it's it's just <laughs> it's actually being disciplined about doing it right. right. Do yeah. it, yeah, that's the <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's always it's always we we are we are fighting against some very very deeply ingrained beliefs yeah oh, yeah probably like, you know even the word limiting whip it's it carries baggage yeah you're, yeah. you're limiting me controlling you know, whip when, i've been using for a while now yeah. controlling whip but yeah. i actually it's, prefer it's, even more like balancing whip you know, yeah. creating a sense of equilibrium like okay I'll, I, I, I'll, sense I'll pick, of, I'll pick yeah. control because i think it taps into that organizational well, need yeah. to feel like they're in control right yeah Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's just that's me being pseudo psychological babble, but you know, maybe it works. Maybe my it. my inner Dan, my inner Dan voice is telling me talk about age. You don't, you don't mean whip, Andy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Talk yeah. about both. Talk yes, about Dan. both. Yes, Dan, I can hear you. You do mean age, Andy? Yeah. So, um, but there is there is one thing that you were saying there that James as well is like the, when when we when we are working with 
I'm talking about like the question was like what are the challenges in implementing Kanban? Many times and sometimes it's using the right language for the context. Um, and I think that's something that occasionally we, we are guilty of in the in the in the agile in the agility space as well, that we yeah. go in with our own te technical terms in some ways and, mm -hmm. and, and they don't connect, they don't land as well as they should. So I like what you say, you know, cycle times, yeah. You know, how long how long can take how long things take to do? To be right, with age. Like, how old is it? How yes. Old is it? How old is it? How, how old does it you? take us to do things? Yeah. How long does you're, it take us to do? Your work in progress. Yeah. How old are you? Oh, I'm fifty. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's your that's your <laughs> whip age. That's simple. Cool. Excellent. Let's go to the next question. Um, Elmo, then to move on. Henrik, you've got a good question there. Would you like to ask your questions? Well, try to pick one, please. Uh, yeah, I can try. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking into uh, you know uh, having a fairly big squad uh, coming up, a new squad with a new PO, uh, with an insanely big scope. So I'm looking into, you know, insane amount of swim lanes and class of services and whatnot. I mean, the full plate. And I'm like, Poo. <laughs> where to start? So I think it was you, Andy, you said, you know, always go for asking questions about the flow. Yeah. So, so looking at a, at a big squad like this, fairly inex uh, 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 inexperienced, with a new PO who maybe doesn't understand the full scope of the squad yet, would you go for him or her, or would you get in the team and then just do it? You know, pound on them through uh, through a few days, and you know, just rip it all out, or would you keep it simple and say, okay, let's start with the PO. Let's also make this into a learning journey for for him or her, uh, uh, onto what the scope is actually is. Yeah, so it's, and it's a great question. There's like you you could pick any approach in the world, and they they may or may not work, right? But I, what I, what I'll do is I'll tell you where my brain would go with this, right? So so am I am I to assume that nobody has any experience in building anything within this context, or you have some level of expertise that we do have? We do have some, okay. uh, luckily, and we do also have some uh, who actually used to do you know scrum master work and whatnot. Okay. But they are a new team put together, so they are fairly overall uh, you know uh, immature in, in yeah, their so, ways so, of thinking. So so my brain is um, th there's two there's two attacks on this one. One is one is to uh, if you really want them to use Kanban, if you feel that Kanban is the right thing to do, um, that's probably one approach to take is, you know, there's there's probably a couple of ways we could approach this complex work and, you know, Kanban is a way of doing it. So let's do, let's all get together and understand what Kanban is. You know, that's number one. We talked about that kind of like as a training level thing. But the one, the, the approach I would probably take, and this is the approach I'm taking with a current client. Um, uh, where they they want to do they want to understand their portfolio flow they want to get better at uh, understanding how long it takes for work etc cetera, etc cetera, right everything we want to get out of this right mm -hmm. um, what I've said to them is uh, this week collect a small working group a small working group because a, a, a opinion by committee is terrible mm -hmm. so so let's let's bring in a few people who actually understand how work is transformed you know. So from product through to delivery, and let's just work it through as just a small working group for now, right? And let's understand the problem we're facing. What does that look like? Because until you start looking at the work and trying to get those knowledge areas of how your current setup is, there's very little point in then having a million opinions and, and lots of people yeah. feeling yeah. aggrieved because, uh, you know, they're potentially moving teams and all that, you know, I guess, you know, all the bad things I've seen previously. So. So this is actually what I'm doing with a client uh, this week, which is starting at that level and having a small working group. Once we've kind of nailed that down, then we can, or, you know, got some kind of agreement that, okay, this is what it looks like. Then we'll start communicating that and maybe start bringing in larger groups to form that and understanding. That's, that's my opinion. That's how I'm approaching it. Um, uh, but there may sense. be, you know, there, there, yeah. there are probably other ones. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. We have time for the other question, maybe? In the in the same uh, one, or should you want we to just add, We probably need to. We will need to move on. But James, okay. do you do you would like to add something else? Um, I can refer to my London colleague, Mister Hiles, on on that. I mean, the textbook answer is is the Kanban system members should design the system because mm. they're doing the work, right? Mm. But the textbook answer isn't always right. So there are times when that wouldn't be the case. If you've got a, a bunch, you know, if you, if you took in a bunch of graduates who'd never built, a bunch, uh, never built any code, never tested anything, never done anything at all, first job, stick six of them in a room and go build your workflow, I think yeah. they're going to go away. 
Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. They might need a little bit of guidance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, at the same time, if I've got, you know, six Google site reliability engineers, I expect them to know what their workflow is, right? Mm -hmm. As an example. So um, contextual. Yeah. It's the classic trainer answer of it depends. It depends. <laughs> Bing! There you go. That's yeah. what for tonight. Yeah. yeah. There was there was one 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 example about this as well. Sometimes when you get when you get people designing Kanban boards, maybe for the first time, that there is one risk is that we over design them. Mm. Yeah. So we I uh, I've seen in uh, an example that, that I was doing with um, UK government when there was suddenly that first Kanban board became like twenty five columns and ten different swim lanes because they wanted to define everything well and so many work items. And and actually what they were doing was um, unintentionally they were adding too much complexity, designing too much complexity and adding too much weight because every column oh, stops yeah. adding weight. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there is a balance between uh, the um, to do doing done, which is not descriptive in half a workflow. And uh, let me tell you absolutely every single possible every step that you might do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how do you actually focus on the flow of work um, without actually start replicating things like the skills or tasks or like, you know, things like that? So, yeah, so, if you, if the more buckets you put down, the more more people will fill them. That's yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Excellent. Um, um, Henrik, if we, if we got time, um, we'd like to go back to the other question because- it's Yeah, that's, question. that's okay. Just, that's totally okay. Let's just go to, to the next one. Um, ben, I'm-, I'm, I'm there are too many questions, so I cannot jump any of them. Ben, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. So it's a slightly geeky question, I suppose, but just reflecting back over the last few years, looking at flow metrics, I just felt that um, you get overwhelmed with the choices of the things that are there. And it's, it's like you see a cycle time and you start off thinking, well, that's, that's nice. What does it mean? And for me, Kanban is more about continual improvement. So before looking at metrics, it's working out what, what outcome is the data related to? So that's something that it's taken me a couple of years to get to. And I'm just wondering whether when you train people on the use of metrics, do you sort of go from the in the moment observations to meaningful improvement that you set out to do? Is that something you think about? Or is that just me? Um, I mean, I tend to try and use the metrics to drive the conversation about what, what, what do we want to improve? How do we make that system slicker I, you know it's and if i think about it from a wider aspect than just a team because quite often you know especially large, large organizations like what i am now the team are just part of a wider stream right they're just one they're one column on a bigger board right? <laughs> or on a board full of bigger stuff so the downstream stuff is all the integration testing and the performance testing and the pen testing and the release stuff and everything else and you know if no one's looking at that the metrics and the cycle times and the things like that for that part of the system then you know what's the point of looking at cycle times from a team's perspective because your gains are tiny right you might well you know we've dropped doing peer reviews in gits and we've gone to peer programming great love it happy with that but as a end-to-end -end life cycle of, of, a, of a unit of value did it make much change not really right so it's it's i, I tend to think of it in, the, in that way my, to, my, my inner, oh, sorry, Ben. No, 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 you go, Ben. I was just going to say, it feels very difficult to celebrate when things improve because it feels a bit academic, a bit theoretical. But it's really important. It actually means a lot of money that you might be saving an organisation as well. And yeah. lots of stress you're saving people. So. Yeah. It comes back to the, the thing at the beginning where if you change the system, then then that's where the mindset starts to change. People are happier and all the rest of that. So, um certainly you know not just looking at it from the perspective of the quantitative data points there is also an aspect of qualitative as well and i think that if if i add to that is like um, i'm going to be a little bit heretic uh, to me the metrics are less much 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 less powerful than the charts is the charts that you can yeah. start? Is charts yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. like it's like looking at the at the um, tea leaves at the bottom of the cup and they start trying to figure out what's happening? Yeah, it's 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 those charts and well, you want to compare with the metrics where allows us to write to ask questions or to or to verify what you are experiencing in the work. Like typical thing, people say, oh, we think that we have to, you know, we have, we have so much work. You can go to things like the chart and say, is that 
is that happening? How is it happening? What kind of consequences? So you, you said that the, the metrics and the charts many times allow us to ask more questions yeah. and to focus on what kind of questions might help us make the improvements. Yeah, so I think so, just, so they're it, very powerful tools in figure. I always say the charts are the metrics and the charts are the best friends of teams. I was yeah, going to I help think us I, make I, decisions. I, I go along with that. I, 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 I qualify my <laughs> I qualify my previous statement around it's not I'm not looking at a single unit and it's cycle time in in you know there's 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 not a great deal of value in that that story mm -hmm. seven took nine days it doesn't really tell me anything right it's what I want to see is and what I'm encouraging my the the the, 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 the teams I work with is what what is the general trend are you improving exactly. overall you know mm -hmm. are, is your it does your work look pretty stable your whip is it quite stable are you you mm -hmm. know rather than um your cycle time is 10 days or less 85 percent of the time it's useful it's a useful thing to talk about and it helps you to understand if you are getting better or not but it you know it, as, as Jose quite rightly says charts trends that kind of thing what one one def one kind of not definition but one thing that Dan Vacanti says which I really really like about like talking about Kanban is like Kanban helps people and teams and departments um ask better questions earlier on yeah and helps us make better decisions early on that doesn't mean that the right decision but it helps us make probably better decisions early on so how do we do that yes sometimes same paying attention to those charts you know what is was the aging chart telling us what is the cfd telling us what is this the cycle time scatterplot telling us uh, where are the improvement opportunities so it's just the, unfortunately this is part of a, the curse of kanban many times that it just makes more questions that gives you answers occasionally what is it? Is that which which Greek philosopher said this thing? The more the more I know, the less I know. I'm going to say Socrates just because it is. Yeah. Why, <laughs> why not? It, I don't it, actually know anything about Greek. Spot on. Spot on. This, spot this is on camera, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I know everything about Greek philosophy. It was Socrates. I'm just going to put that in. <laughs> yeah, now and now, and anyone who challenges that is wrong. There you go. Okay. Good stuff, Ben. Is all right. Good. All right. Okay. Well, uh, going to from Ben to Stuart. No, uh, that, that that was just stupidity, and that, okay. that that was just thinking that James had asked everybody a question and didn't realise there was another James on the call. Ah, okay. <laughs> I know what. It, I did. Oh, I thought it was a question. I thought it was a question there, and I didn't realise that it was. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, Don, you have a, a a long one there with a question at the end. Would you like to? Yeah, maybe a follow up a little bit on Ben's theme, actually. But, yeah. um, I mean, I'm really you know I'm hooked on the metrics and the flow and the charts and all that stuff. Really, really love it. Um, but you know, sometimes we're a bit out, actually output focused. I find, and that you know, we can you can have teams that are kind of like predictably firing out user stories at a rate that you know that makes people happy. But stepping back and thinking about the outcomes and how much learning we're getting from this, and and um, how, how much experimentation are we, you know, as our organisation um, doing, I wonder like the, the flow metrics. You know, we can apply them to those sorts of things as well. And I wonder if you have any experience of that, um, particularly maybe tracking value items through to has it achieved the outcome or not. You know, um, that sort of stuff. So that's an interesting one because, I mean, if you look at the the if you look at the four flow metrics that are in the Kanban guide, then none of them really attest to benefits tracking, right? Particularly, um, but that said. I had a conversation just yesterday where I was taking a team through um, through the through the metrics and through Actual Agile and talking them through what I could do for them, et cetera, et cetera. And we looked at their work in progress age and I picked out this one really old thing that was been in their board for 60 days or some nonsense. And I turned around and said, you know, this is this is really old. This will be the first thing I'd want to talk about um, on a daily stand-up, for example. And the, the, the chap on the call came and said, oh, he said, oh, well, that one's not really very important. I mean, that's why we, you know, we've kind of left it because we've been doing other stuff that's a bit more important. And the simple answer was, why is it on your board if it's not the value? Right? If you're valuing it less than anything else, why is it even on there in the first? Why have you even bothered to start it? So I think that I, I, I tend to look at it from that perspective of there shouldn't be anything on your board that isn't going to give you the value you think it's going to give you. Or isn't all that isn't isn't a good punt at least in that respect, right? Because you never you're never going to guarantee it. But or um, you have no or you have no intention to finish. Correct, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. and then I think that you know, you know, it's the same as anything that is useful, I guess, if you can put a 
a, a dollar figure on what you think that unit of value is going to do for you, whatever dial that's going to turn, whether it's, you know, an uptake in, in customers or an uptake in revenue or whatever else it is. And then, you know, you, you do need to have a, um, some sort of way of um, being able to decide whether or not that has actually achieved. And in a way, there's a kind of a downstream Kanban board for, for, for doing that stuff because done and live, there, are, there might be steps after that. There might be a bit that says, actually go away and do some surveys and go away and collect some data or do some MI and actually then did it. And then does that answer the question of, did we do it? And then those, that, that, that unit of value also has cycle times across that piece as well. Right. So you've got, you've got that aspect. Andy? Andy? Uh, oh uh, yeah. So I was just, I was just kind of reflecting on this. The only thing that keeps going through my head is um, a tool for conversation and um, so I was going to, uh, I was just kind of thinking, you know, the way I described Scrum, I, I described Scrum like a, it's a conversation framework and uh, Kanban is a, a flow conversation framework. And um, the one thing by your, uh, your question, I wonder whether your organization not knowing it is um, uh, more metrics focused than outcome focused anyway. So you're being asked for certain, you know, deli you know, number of things that you create rather than the value driver for, you know, kind of going back to what James is saying, the value driver for why you're doing the work. For me, this goes, this is, um, dare I say, outside of, you know, Kanban will help you understand how quickly and how well you are delivering, right? you know and scrum will help you understand are we doing the right thing you know within our within our, our our month or less but actually this this kind of question goes a little bit outside of that which is how focused is your organization on delivering the right things because that well actually and i would say there might be a a, a piece which is uh, something i was experimenting with around um how aware are the teams on the impact that they are having in whatever they're delivering as well um, so I talk, a, I talk a lot about actually mm -hmm. engaging the teams more into the customer um, uh, perspective around the, the kind of the value of the change. One of the ways I was experimenting with this was actually giving the team a budget. Uh, uh, I was going to copyright this, but it's it's on Zoom and recorded, so it's now my idea, and we can sell it. Right, that's also been around for years. So I'm, yeah. I just want to talk um, about uh, <laughs> but but uh, you know, giving the team a budget in which to select work. And so the team have an intrinsic cost every time they go and do some work. Therefore, every time they select some work, that should be a intrinsic value. So I don't know if Cornelius, you know, if you remember me doing this at, when I was at Yale, we had monopoly money. Yeah. <clears throat> I and remember we attributed that. a value very, to the car. Very, very well. Right. And then the team got monopoly money and that was it. They get to spend what they were going to do. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and returning that investment, right. And, and returning that back to the, back to the business in terms of an outcome. Uh, and, and, you know, so that's part one. And, the, the, you know, the second part is, you know, getting the customers closer to the delivery. I'll go back on the, you know, Kanban tool for a conversation, Scrum tool for a conversation, you know, yeah. you know, you know, Prince tool for a conversation, maybe a bit more structured, but, you know, you know, that's how it works. And um, conversation. <laughs> a conversation. Um, but so but there is, there's another thought on this as well, which, I, yeah. which just pops into my head, which is, um, there's a couple of things actually, which is if your backlog is what I would think of as a traditional backlog in which most organizations is just a, basically a fait accompli to-do list. You must do all these things. Then you're not managing value in the first place, right? Because you're not actually thinking about what's optional and what's not. Um, and if I think about that from the, you know, everybody uses Blockbuster as a great example of an organization that didn't pivot. You've, while, while it is useful to put that dollar figure on, there is also the experimentational and the human side of all this as well. You've got to bear in mind in terms of value as well, because one of the big drivers for Blockbuster not to do anything different was 12% of their revenue came from late fees. Right? So they make money from people not returning the DVDs on time. So why would they want to give it? Why would they want to post it to you? So you can post it back on time. That's not, you know, it doesn't help them, for instance. So, um, so it, you know, when you're thinking about that, backlog make sure is it is that it, it, uh, you have options in there stuff that you can decide to cash in on or not but also that value is not necessarily just bottom line yeah that, that is there is a couple of things that, that i love to add i mean one is like sometimes that in many of our agile environments not just Kanban, but generally is 
we are doing all this work, which allegedly has value, but many times it's so difficult to connect it to why are we doing this? How is this helping our organization yeah. move the dial? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the amount of times you go to a team like, we, we, why you, you might have a goal, but how is this helping the organization yep. as a whole? That systemic view of the organization many times is missing. Okay. Right. What is the organization's decision-making framework for value? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing is about value. We, we take value so much as if it was a deterministic figure. Yeah. And it's yeah. not. It's yeah. not. I mean, I, I really recommend you watching uh, the video. I put it on chat. Uh, Dan Vacantin's, Dan Vacantin's uh, Don't Be a Dick Cat presentation. Um, he was uh, published. He did it at uh, Link, London Link and Band Days Conference 2019. It's on InfoQ website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Great video, and, and 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 that's really controversial in some ways because we we are taking the, the idea we we may have an idea of what the value is of something, but we don't really know until it's delivered. Yep. So try to try try to take anything that you do as a as a risk. It's a risk that is not going to work. You know, it's a hypothesis. Validate it. Going to what James was saying, how many times companies deliver things, and we never measure the impact it has yeah. generated. It's just delivered and delivered. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's it's yes, but how are we, how do we actually do these things well or not? Mm -hmm. um, many times we don't we don't follow as companies we don't follow the our own advice. You know, what's the business case? No, what validates the business case? I love, I love business cases. Business cases are my favorite anti pattern <laughs> but, because, but, because but, if you want but, to but, get something approved, if you want your project to go ahead, yeah. chuck more crap into it <laughs> because many the more money you ask for. Yeah. The more likelihood it will get approved because people equate cost with value. Yeah, and but also as many times because no one ever measures the, the, what, what um, happened afterwards. And, and therefore, like, I mean, I've got uh, a five million pound project. It's the most important project in the portfolio. It's only five million pounds because you filled it full of rubbish. I was, I was working, I was working with a company that particular department um, learned that as soon as they could justify that anything was going to give more than a million or two million profit or return, yeah, the board will approve it. Yeah. So, what happened? <laughs> Every single piece of initiative Every, yeah. that they had in mind was going to be one or two million pounds. And they could they could just tell whatever. I mean, they were great to give me any politician. They could just tell you anything they wanted. Yeah. Why? Because they knew that no one measured at the other end and said, like, yeah. you know, let's let's just actually I'm gonna play on that a bit because you know, I've had similar experiences of uh people not gaming the system, right? When they absolutely could have. But <laughs> going back to like all of the things about metrics, right? You know, uh all metrics can be games. Mm -hmm. and, and so you know it, i guess it for me it just backs up that kind of whole the focus the focus is on the conversation i've had a, a, some a, a great example that um uh i can't say the name of the client but a great example of where we put metrics in front of teams and it was more about the conversation about what they're going to get delivered from a value point of view right an outcome point of view versus the numbers the numbers were absolutely important because they were the driver for the conversation, mm -hmm. but it was more the fact that certain items that w of value were not going to get delivered. Yeah. And um, but yeah, you know, all metrics can be gamed though. That's that's the uh, that's the thing to watch. And, and, and the, and the, the, a big watch out for me with the flow metrics is uh, it's actually what I've experienced today that I've had to kind of jump on. Where um, the thing to remember is they are they are just measures, right? Yeah. It is a measure only. Mm. What I've had today is somebody putting into their OKRs because that's how we're going to do value, right? OKR is throughput up by fifteen percent. I mean, oh yeah. What if you're at the best you could possibly be? <laughs> What's going to happen? You're going to spend tons of people's time oh. and money and energy trying to get you know at that extra percent out. That's just pointless. You're good. You're good enough, right? If that's the case, so just be careful that you don't turn your measures into targets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just All looking right, at okay. uh, Henrik's, um, Henrik's uh, comment about uh, kind of like when when a value equals MPS. Yes, I've been there. Oh, yes, <laughs> I've been there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, great, great comment. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go. Uh, we're running out of time. Let's get another question, which uh, oh, no. I think is going to be very good. Um, Cornelius, you got a question about um, people's and behaviors, the metrics? Uh, um yeah, absolutely. Before I ask the question, I just want to comment on on, on James at Yell with the the, the monopoly money. Um, that had a, quite a big influence for me. So wherever I moved on, I used and, and evolved that one. So I've I've got into the habit when you work with a team that you work out what the cost of that team is, 
Um, and if you can, you make it visible. You know, the average what London rate for themes is about 15 to 17, 18K a week. And then you say, are we what we're producing <laughs> worth more than that 17 or 18K? And it, and it has a massive impact on mm -hmm. decisions yeah. um, from over engineering to, um, you know, you obviously get product owners and people at first stump going, uh, well, I didn't know how to think about that to, you know, but, but that exercise you did, James. What I should have done was mm -hmm. bought shares in Waddington's, mm -hmm. right? Because I'd be rich. The amount of Monopoly sets I've had to buy just to get the money. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, so my, my, my question and um, is, uh, I probably didn't phrase it in the right way over there, but what, what is the, the connection between behaviors that you would see or potentially expect and the, the metrics in particularly with, with program band? I think I'd default to my previous answer, which is, uh, and, and actually both, and I can make a point like this because they're either side of me, uh, Jose and Andy have both um, said, which is that the, um, it's a tool for a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And all the metrics are a tool for a conversation. Mm -hmm. So from a human perspective, I see that all of that is bringing back to what I said earlier around using those tools to make sure that you're asking the right questions. Thank you, Jose. Um, and, and to change the system and then changing the system is the thing that affects the people and makes you know makes work more enjoyable when you're when you're personally in flow you feel better about what you're doing right you enjoy your work when you're when you've got lots of blockers and dependencies and stuff like that and you can't get stuff done that's when you're not in flow and you don't feel particularly happy so mm. for me it's that I, I look at it from that angle of it's about changing the system to change the behaviors if you like can I, I, I want to rewind my thing from earlier, like whip, uh, um, uh, whatever I just called that whip. Um, uh, patience, God. whip patience, whip in patience. patience. Thank you. What, patience. you know, yeah. I'm going to change that question. I'm, actually, that. I, <laughs> I'm going to say, actually, what, <clears throat> what uh, the, the hardest thing about Kanban is, is getting development teams or teams that are doing the work uh, enthused about the power it can bring because you know we can sit there and go oh my god it's so cool and and actually bringing people along on that journey that human side is so important otherwise you're just the metrics kanban you know person who comes and says a load of things <laughs> and i think you yeah 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 and i and i think the frustration the frustration i think is it kanban comes from a a place of working you know within a team working to solve complex problems trying to figure out flow and do better and that's where it should live um you know we we are trainers we come in and, and train and help and coach but i want ultimately the team to then go and understand the metrics and the measures and the charts so they're not relying on me to be able to interpret them yeah. you know they can understand the power of the tool that's being put in front of them to make the decisions and work with the product owners and that's basically where it should all live so yeah kind of rewind my my whip impatience thing actually you know between those two that that's you know i would love more teams uh, to to just start working this and then start r pulling that help in and just saying look you know we you know, we don't really fully understand this you know can you help us here you yeah. know th rather it be the other way around I think so you know a weird pattern on the chart and we don't understand it can you help us try and interpret it that that's, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 but, but, but this... I can see the the connections there because I kind of see Kanban and actually Scrum as well as as a framework for learning I've mentioned this before because mm -hmm. I don't remember that mm -hmm. and um, on, on the behaviors, um, we're looking at flow over a large amount of teams at the moment, about 170 teams or so. Um, and instead of just jumping into the behaviors straight away, oh, the, 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 the metrics, um, we're talking about the behaviors that we think is um, the behaviors that we believe are the good ones to try and follow or strive or improve on. So the minimized waiting, um, stop starting, start finishing and you know breaking work down into smaller pieces and then if you want to look at those three behaviors which you know um if you, if you want to try and follow and, and, and have examples of those behaviors then for the minimized weight things your cycle time um for the you know stop starting start finishing your whip limits um and breaking work down smaller is as is, is throughput um so there is something there is something really interesting on this and, and when when i when i was starting to look at scrum with kanban the one thing that really got my me excited about was the following we, we talk about trust and we talk about collaboration different different words in different places we talk about right. focus right. we talk about self-organization or self-management now we talk about all these different things yeah and 
and then what we do many times teams are under a lot of pressure they are overworked they are you know um, there is they, they are not trusted they are blamed for any problems they are there we do everything deterministically so we have an aspirational end game of what we would like to build better better human environments and the reality is that many times we even with the best intentions and even in the agile world we 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 do things which are the opposite of it the, anth the antithesis of it well for me to connecting to things like metrics and all the stuff then one of the most powerful things you can do um, is helping people understand the, the aging metrics and it's that you know it's super powerful in the sense of thinking about like this is what we're, we're causing to us we're causing a lot of damage to us yeah we got too much work it's slowing us down we are not finishing the work we are we are so aware that we cannot collaborate we have blockers which can live there forever you know, what james was talking about before so let's start bringing doing changes by trying that that eventually lead towards the opportunity to focus the opportunity to collaborate the opportunity right. to start delivering the opportunity to ask questions so i see that, that with page is is a is a is the the light bulb moment for me with with page was it was the the best way i could think of of articulating uh start finishing stop starting yeah, and, and, and the conversation about limiting WIP or controlling WIP is a very, very difficult one many times in companies. But if you put H here and say, like, do you realize all this work that has been here for the last 367 days? <laughs> Does it really make any sense? Oh, no. You've been looking at my gear hey, reports. Maybe we can do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> How do we go about it? Well, you know, you start thinking of a flow and the way to do it is to start reducing the amount of work we have. Yeah. Mm. So, so many times the the metrics the metrics leads to people to realize behaviors as well to realize like this is what we are causing to ourselves. You know, we can never. When was the last time you paired? If you have like a backlog, a personal backlog of fifteen things that you are doing, yeah, um, you will never have time to collaborate. You will never have time to learn. You will never have time to do all the other things that we want about. Mm. So, so yeah, I, I think that I think there is a connection in, in how we use these things to 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 drive better behaviors to enable better behaviors as well. well not only that's the right word, but yeah. The other the other last one, and then I'll keep quiet, you know, if I say just tell me to <laughs> stop, is um I'm 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 personally a lot more interested in those behaviors because I, I if somebody can find a better way of measuring those behaviors, then I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. Um so you know if you find a better way of measuring throughput or a better way of of of, of um you know, because that's, you know, you know, breaking work down smaller or a better way of measuring minimized weighting, then, then, you know, that that's great. And that, that'll yeah. be amazing. So. I, I would say one thing for me is like the, 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 of all the agile measures, the Kanban measures that we have, the one that I actually probably pay least attention to is throughput. Because, because I think throughput many times is, um, first of all, is aging and whip then we can start looking at cycle time then we can look, look at so yeah. throughput but many times companies i think jump into throughput first uh, is the typical is the typical focus. scaling conversation yeah. Yeah. or hire more people yeah. you want more yeah. throughput um yeah. in order to get more throughput first of all we have to create the conditions for more throughput to happen and wow. that, that and that happens through okay. whip through aging through cycle time yeah so uh, that's what i call my my, my nirvana no, that, that that's spot on. For me, throughput was more like as things are blocked. Then we look at what behaviors can we do to unblock it. And, and so yeah, no, brilliant. Thanks. Uh, it's an interesting thing, right? There's a whole bunch of other metrics that are not Kanban metrics that you could think about. That's right? well. <laughs> blocked time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, whatever it is, time in a particular, you know, cycle time for a particular state or uh, the amount of rework that you generate in your process. How much? How, how often yeah. have you got? You know, Get in the defects in the way I can fix yeah. them. You know, things like that. like I mean, my personal pet peeve. Um, I've been been in an ex developer, is Git, because the <laughs> Git workflow does my nut, right? And it does my nut because peer review, right? It puts this puts this idle thing in <laughs> deliberately, and I'm like, why, why, <laughs> right? So, um, and the. The problem for me is, is that you've got a whole bunch of engineers now coming through who, who work in Git. And Git, by the way, was always meant to be an open source project repository, right? Mm -hmm. Source management. For, so you've got people all around the world collaborating. So the peer review in that respect, in that respect, makes some sense, right? Because you've got a community, you peer reviewing changes to your open source product. 
internally, it makes no sense whatsoever, right? To your own products, your own company, your own set of code and standards, your own architectural guidelines, all the rest of that that goes with it makes no, 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 no sense whatsoever. Because what happens is, and what I typically see, and I've got a whole bunch of JIRA boards that I can't show you that demonstrate this really well. <laughs> Development done, waiting for review column in JIRA, right? And, <clears throat> and it's... I would say my 85% is that one has got the most stuff in it across all those boards. And 85% of those boards, that's the um, biggest column. Sorry, just for me, sir. Oh, we're listening to Jose twice. Uh, no, no, yeah. I'm just uh, <laughs> finding, finding a link. That's because he's got such good things to say. He does. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but it kills me because I'm like, right, okay, so what is the wait time for peer review for your squad? I think 85, what is your 85 percentile wait time just on that column and they go oh it's, it's about two weeks i'm like you're working in two week sprints what are you doing sorry sorry cornelius go no no it's just if you basically reduce that waiting time for get by 10 percent. what efficiency improvement have you made <laughs> things um, like that things like that drive me mad yeah. So, 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 so for me, a lot of the, you know, so there's, so there's that term velocity. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know what? I don't know where it came from. <laughs> right. I, I just, I genuinely don't know where it came from. And, um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know. I've, I've not, uh, uh, I've not looked, looked for it quite honest with you. And I think that the 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 problem comes when you have um uh tools like jira and other tools that that promote this concept of velocity as a metric for efficiency you know etc uh, you know in combination with my my second thing which is the 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 story point fiasco you know this this idea of understanding how you know how whether we should decompose work brilliant love it you know great idea but not a forecasting tool no bad idea yeah. so uh, you know and that combined with with, with um you know if we're going to go back onto that throughput thing you know it, it's it's quite easy just to say just count the number of things right you know you there you go bang throughput right you know, but that but that's a i always use that as a starting point it's a measure it's it's probably the best measure uh, way above story points you know in terms of you're just measuring throughput it will give you an indication and over time it will give you an indication of probably the instability of your system but Fine. it's you know if you can't measure anything else let's let's hit that first and then you know while you're doing that let's go look at the other sorry sorry james the velocity thing crops up a lot and i'm not sure if you said you may have told me this once upon a time Pussy, but if i've incorrectly attributed this right you can slap me with a wet fish the um uh, that velocity is that is you know story points and burn ups and burn downs and all the rest of that um magic right uh is our way of describing velocity which is just a case of how far are we going to go over time yeah right so it's that kind of time distance time equation thing there are other ways of understanding velocity and as andy quite rightly says counting the things that you do right throughput monte carlo blah 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 all that stuff is another way of framing velocity yeah absolutely and, and that's the interesting thing i mean i was doing this this exactly conversation in a talk recently i call it like, all my story points are belong to us um yes yeah playing with it uh, and and what, what i was talking about with these things like the, the question itself is how much how much stuff can we do on a period of time yeah that, 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 that's the key yeah how much right. stuff could we yeah. potentially do forecast multiple a, 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 a multiple amount of work yeah um, so velocity is a way of doing it. It's, it will be story points per per um, per sprint, for example. Yeah, number of items. You know, um, then you made other velocities, which will be count of tickets per um, or PBIs per per sprint. Throughput will be number of items per unit of time. Those are the, those are similar or very equivalent expressions of the same thing you know how much yeah. stuff can we do over a period of time just use something that is relatively predictable the biggest the biggest problem with velocity and story points is that it's used is going to averages yeah and and in yeah. complex world please don't use averages so and that's actually even that's true with story painting, right it doesn't matter what what you're using if you're averaging <laughs> for your for your velocity you're in trouble yeah. um i had a conversation with students <laughs> week, week, last week, week before who were talking about that they're continually over committing in their sprints right and i don't even know if commitment's the right word to use mm. anymore in scrum terms because i just gave up with all that a while back but um 
and they were saying, well, yeah, we, we only ever deliver about half the story points we ever want to do. I said, well, have you ever considered just planning off of what you do then? You know, and or how many stories are you doing every sprint? And well, we're actually doing about six stories every sprint. Well, why don't you just plan six stories? Yeah. Right. Was, why are you making life hard yeah. for stuff? Yeah. You know, sitting around yeah. for, for a four hour session, holding up cards and arguing about a two <laughs> and a one. It's not helping you, is it? Get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Grump, yeah, grumpy Andy the, coming out. <laughs> the story point, the story point, and the planning poker thing is like the the actually the most important part of that is the conversation. Going back to yeah. conversations, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but where do we spend more time is in the mechanics of the story pointing of the of the planning poker, which is the least important one. And right. actually, it's it's a, it's in some ways is it it's deluding us into thinking we have more knowledge and more precision. I mean, yeah. the whole thing about story pointing and, and and planning poker is about like, can we do it? It's, is it small enough to be done in the period of right. that? Right, well, so then all. it comes back to right sizing, doesn't it? Right, that's, and yeah, I'm okay. I'm to totally okay yeah. with teams using story points to right size work. Cornelius, just Cornelius is trying to Cornelius. jump in, chaps. Cornelius, Cornelius go for is it. Go, go, go. Well, to jump in. Well, well, this this is something that's close to my heart, and I've worked on this for ages now. And I, I kind of came to the point with story points and, and poker planning that um, I ask why, why, why are we doing this? Right, and a lot of people think you know it's to plan, forecast, our capacity, see how much we can get done. I'm not going. No, that's the wrong why. It's like saying, why does the why does the company do what they do? It's to make money. No, right? They try and solve customers' problem and make money through it. It's it's the output of it, not the why. Yeah. Me, um, why do we do a relative estimation? Is to ensure that everybody has got um, the same level of knowledge about the work we're about to embark on. So if you find that everybody has the same opinion or sees the work in a similar way, you find those numbers start converging. So yeah. if our understanding of the work we're about to embark on is similar. If it's not similar, you get differences. Now, if you if you do it on that basis, based on team understanding of the work or the work they are planning or the thing they're trying to do before they do it, um, then they'll get to a number which they guess it's this or that. I don't really care what the number is. Um, and therefore, then it's useful. That's funny. Then the output becomes really useful for all the other stuff they want to use it for. Um, but you never estimate for um, capacity planning or for predicting. You're, you're doing that activity to make sure we understand things at the same level. And if there's differences, talk about it, right? Why do you think it's small? Why do you think it's big? Why do you think it's a lot harder work? And why do you think it's really easy? Well, it's easy because I've done it. I'm just going to copy and paste and change it. <laughs> well, you haven't considered X, Y, Z. Oh, you're right. How do we do X, Y, Z? And, and that's really why we do estimation. But <laughs> and one thing, estimating is important. The yeah. estimate is probably less important. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing I, I just put on the on the chat, the one thing that I really, really like, if you're going to do a story pointing or planning poker and things like that, lunar, lunar logic estimation cards. It gives you three options. Basically, it's, it's, a small, it's a small enough, it's too big, yeah. I don't yeah. understand it. Yeah, yeah. And that's all you need. Yeah. With those three, you can do. You, we can do the estimation that we need to know. But yeah, um, shall we? Shall we move on? Because we uh, um, we are kind of like at the end. Of our, our yeah, I don't want to spend all my three points. Um, I could. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we got a question. We talk, we're talking about size and estimation and planning poker. So I'm going to ask a question that was sent to me um, privately. So, um, how do you deal with work items of very different size and the effect of, that the effect they have on metrics like? predictability stability and so on. Uh, over to you so so well my first thought is it planned or unplanned right let's you know, assume that it's planned it's like my kids <laughs> <laughs> you know for, for, uh, so i always talk about refinement being the most important thing you know in terms of understanding your work and it, it fits in directly into the conversation we've had um, I, I'm 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 a big kind of uh, um, supporter of the size doesn't matter with it within reason though mm -hmm. that you, you know if you if you're just taking work in regardless that's that's not good team behavior but if you're actually taking work in under the knowledge that it's going to be highly complex and difficult and a bit gnarly that and and the team are happy with that then then you know that's that's going to be a, le a lesson one way or another you're either going to find out that it was a really bad idea or a really good idea and the impact is then on whoever you're delivering to or, or the you know the outcome you're delivering for um but but uh 
I don't think it's an it depends for me. I think as long as it's within the consensus of the 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 team that are, that are going to execute against the work, and you have had some due diligence in terms of the refinement, you know, and, uh, for the flow, then then it, for me it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, James, any anything more on that? Um, I, if I look at it from a kind of mechanistic perspective, right? If I was running. Um, a production line manufacturing widgets first of all i kind of want all those widgets to be roughly the same size so then again we're back to right sizing right what's the right size mm. um because and in a in a in a physical world that variability in size is quite controlled right it's the same thing over and over and over and over and so the variability is small um as far as uh, the, the kind of a knowledge work side of it, that variability is naturally going to be wider, right? You can have a wider band of variation in your data and that, and, and I'm okay with that because if I, you know, if I take the cycle time scatter plot as, a, as an example, it will, that 85%, that 85th percentile will accommodate all my larger or unexpectedly larger or things we didn't realize, whatever, all that fun stuff. And we'll um, factor that in. So your cycle time will be wherever your cycle time is. It's still, that 85% is still uh, a reasonable degree of reliability at that point. Um, but I would, you know, that's where then I think if you are having that wide band, if you've got quite a, you know, if you look at your chart from a quality perspective and you've got loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of really fast stuff, and then you've got a load of stuff that, you know, that, that's higher up, but pushing is skewing your data, then, you know, it's kind of redouble your efforts to, to um, understand the work before you start it right size I think, that, I, th I think that's important that's the right sizing versus same sizing conversation as well yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh, as you say it's like it's not the work is going to be intrinsically different it just yeah. has to it just has to more or less have the same nature of a work mm -hmm. with with the differences in size or whatever it is yeah but but it has to be about the same nature if you're if you're if you're putting like very fine sand and huge rocks through your through your work then that's that's not the same work that's not you cannot deal with it the same way so it has to be at least similar enough um then yeah size yeah. size will be different and i and I, i've got some teams that are doing some very very different types of work so i've got um, a team that are dealing with external partnerships and so they have to respond to rfps they have to respond mm -hmm. to audits and they also do a bunch of other stuff in terms of dealing with um some aggregate um, organizations that they work with and so I actually encourage them to split those you know, as part of the limitation of JIRA. I might do this on one board in a real world, but you know, who knows? But the limitation of JIRA is, right, well, you put the RFPs on this board because that's the workflow for that kind of work and the audits on this board for that because it's got a different workflow and the different sizes. And then you can kind of make some sort of sense out of it and you'll, you'll be able to get that, that right size and becomes easier because you've separated out your work types as opposed to try and go, how do we right size a an RFP, which is a massive RFP compared to a, an audit on a small data point, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Cool. Excellent. Nice to use um, a non software one for a change. Yeah. Um, I am mindful that we are at the quarter pass, so 75 minutes of lots of great questions. So we finish, we're going to finish here now. Um, the recording of this video will be in the um, uh, Linaya London playlist on YouTube. We will be sharing the links on both the Prokanban community meetup group and the Linaya London meetup group. Um, hopefully, it will be a few days. Uh -huh. My lead time is about six months. At which point, everything I said is in the public domain and I'm in trouble. Yeah, I mean, all this thing about uh, Andy, Andy um, claiming copyright, nah, yeah. public disclosure now. Oh. So, <laughs> so Thank you very much, guys. I mean, it's been excellent. I think we could continue for a long time. Maybe, maybe we have to get you back to do it again. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for for being here today and and sharing great thoughts, great questions. Yeah. Um, we we'll stay in touch. Um, if you want to continue these kind of conversations and and you know and ask you know see what the community offers, with your own experiences, share, ask questions, help other people. Um, join the uh, Prokanban Slack channel. Um, we will put it again on the on the um, um, YouTube um, YouTube Meetup um, the link. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, you can you can join that um, um, Slack channel, and that's where the community can you know provide help, questions, answers, all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, feel free to follow Andy on Twitter. He loves it. Uh, <laughs>
Excellent. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for having us, Jose. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Jose. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, Zoom wave, you've got to do the Zoom wave. Zoom wave. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a thing? Why am I participating? I'm